Hello, I'm Pastor Ruth Privey coming from West Jefferson United Methodist Church in Ohio, and we welcome you to worship today. Our big greeting and, and grand opening announcement is that next Sunday, April, no, it's not April yet, is it? It just seems like April, February 21st. <laughs> We will be in person, so when I goof up in front of the whole congregation, everyone will know it all at the same time. <laughs> 10 o'clock, right here, be there. So let us open with a word of prayer. Holy God, upon the mountain you revealed our Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. By his transfiguration, enlighten our path that we might dare to suffer with him in the service of humanity and so share in the everlasting glory of him who reigns and lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Now our priest team will come. Hello, everybody. <laughs> happy Valentine's to you and your loved ones. We're so happy to see you today, and I am overjoyed that we'll be able to see everybody in person next week. And Lucy and Hannah will be back, and we're going to need everybody to help with that, because <laughs> they haven't been out for a long time. <laughs> we're going to need all hands on deck. All right, we're going to start off today with What a Friend. I got it. Ready? A one, two, a one, two, three. <laughs> Yeah. 
we go. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good
The scripture this morning comes from Mark 9, verses 2 through 10. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for there was... They were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could even mean. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come to our prayer time this morning, we would remind you, you can send prayer requests into the office um, on email. We'll uh, take care of those and send those out to the congregation. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. A holy God, loving, gracious, on this day of love that we celebrate, love in our world and in our lives, we remember and are grateful for the great, great love that you have for us. It is truly who we are, because it is truly who you are. And so we thank you, we praise you, and we worship you this morning, surrounded in that great love. So for all of those, O oh God, who continue to search for the love in their lives, may we be a reflection of you as we love others, as we love you. Continue, O oh God, to lead us and guide us. We lift those to you who need your healing touch. To those who are grieving, may you give them comfort. To those who are searching, light their path. To those in difficult relationships on this Valentine's Day, when others are celebrating love and they are frustrated and saddened, may your love buoy them up. For all of us, O oh God, as we want to do your will, lead us and guide us. And next week when we come together to celebrate, may it truly be that celebration of you and the Holy Spirit in our midst as we come and praise and worship you together again. We thank you and we praise you. We love you, Lord, and we know that your love is everlasting for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray these words that, that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is called Maiden's Song, and it's inspired by Mary's song. Happy Valentine's Day. And then, then 
Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> this is that day in the church year when we celebrate Christ's transfiguration, or commemorate, I suppose. And here's something for you to think about. Did you know that the Greek word transformation or tra transfiguration is the word metamorphophy from the word which we get metamorphosis from? I bet our children could tell us something about metamorphosis. Even our, our youngest ones have, have uh, had this and they enjoy it and to watch as something completely transforms. A complete change of appearance and form is the uh, dictionary definition of, of transfiguration or transformation. The best example we have, of course, is metamorphosis is a transformation of a lowly caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. That process has thrilled people through the ages. Butterflies are beautiful and fascinating, and many butterflies, such as the monarch, are migratory and are capable of long-distance flights. They migrate during the day when they use the sun to orient themselves. And because of their striking beauty, they're often seen as works of art. Because of the mysterious process by which they change from ugly caterpillars to beautiful butterflies. They're often seen as a symbol of new life. That's why we use butterflies at Easter. So the butterfly can have many meanings. One Japanese superstition says that if a butterfly enters your guest room and perches there, the person whom you love most is coming to see you. Some people say that a butterfly is uh, good luck, and maybe we need to plant butterfly gardens a little more. But there's an old story of a couple of old caterpillars who are watching a chrysalis. Now a chrysalis is to a butterfly what a cocoon is to a moth. And so suddenly the chrysalis bursts open to reveal a beautiful butterfly that stretches its wings and flies away. One caterpillar turns to the other and says, ah, you'll never get me up in one of those things. Well, in the wonderful way that God has created the world, 
that Caterpillar will soon or later will say, I'm going to get up in one of those things, and I will fly. But I think it's interesting that the term indicating the transfiguration of Jesus would be so closely tied to a term describing the metamorphosis of a butterfly. It can help us appreciate how dramatic the change in Jesus' appearance was on that mountain when he was with his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. I'm not saying that Christ's transfiguration was anything like the metamorphosis of a butterfly. He certainly didn't sprout wings and fly off the mountain like Superman. But something happened that day, something miraculous, something that his disciples would never forget. You've heard the story that Jeannie read. One day, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain. And suddenly and quite dramatically, on that mountain, Jesus was transfigured right in front of them. And suddenly, his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. It's an amazing scene if we can visualize it in our minds. We'll experience that sense of awe. It reminds me of a similar situation and a similar scene in the Old Testament when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Do you remember that? Moses came down the mountain having been in the presence of God and, and quite mysteriously his face shone so much reflecting the glory of God that he had to wear a veil. And his face was so radiant that the people were afraid to come near him. That's interesting, I think. In the same way, when Peter, James, and John were on the mountain with Jesus, his clothes became dazzling white. But that's not all. Not only did the disciples see Jesus transfigured, but they also saw two of the Old Testament's premier figures of Elijah and Moses with them. Now, Elijah and Moses were talking with Jesus, and they witnessed it. They saw it. It's more than these disciples could process. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is so good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Mark tells us that Peter didn't even know what to say. He was so frightened, which is really unusual for Peter. But he never missed an opportunity to open his mouth and plant his foot in it. And maybe if this happened today, Peter would have asked Jesus if he could post pictures of this event on Facebook or Instagram. I can hear him now, Master, is it all right if I take a selfie? Peter had no clue what he was saying. And that's all right, because it was beyond understanding. And then, as if all things had not gotten mysterious enough, a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Didn't we hear that a few weeks ago? At the baptism? This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. I don't know about you, but if I heard a voice coming out of a cloud like that, I'd be ready to beat a hasty retreat. But the three disciples were probably already in a state of shock. And so Jesus transfigured Moses and Elijah. They're in their presence. Now there's a voice in the cloud. It was really more than they could possibly take in. And then suddenly, Mark tells us, that when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Now that's significant. Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets. So after God announces that Jesus is his son, the law and the prophets disappear. Moses and Elijah disappear, and Jesus alone remains. And so the law and the prophets have served their time and pass away, but Jesus, who is the fulfillment of both the law and the prophets, remains. So what happened on that mountain is a visual representation of what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So the law and the prophets had served their purpose, but the time of the Messiah is at hand. So this incident also draws our attention to the old and new covenants, a new era is on the horizon. A dawn is about to break. The old covenant represented by Moses and Elijah is passing away. And the new covenant coming through death and resurrection of Jesus is coming. This is the new covenant, the one that Jeremiah speaks of. Jeremiah says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. 
The Lord declares, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. And no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. It's a magnificent event on this week of transfiguration. And only Peter, James, and John were there to see it. We don't know why this honor was accorded only to them. Unless the answer is found in the last verse of Mark's account. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rises from the dead. Now, it could very well be that the other disciples had been there. They wouldn't have been able to keep the secret. The impact of this event was so enormous that surely one of them would have gone home and said to his wife, Honey, this has been the greatest day of my life. You're not going to believe what happened to us up on the mountain with Jesus today. I'm not supposed to tell anybody. And I, but I'll burst if I don't. If I tell you, though, you can't tell anyone. And the very next day, his wife is on the phone with her best friend. Listen, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but. Well, you know how it goes. The salvation story had not run its course yet. It was essential that some things not yet be revealed. So only Christ's three closest associates beheld his glory on the mountain that day. But they were sworn to secrecy until after Christ's death and resurrection. So this was an astounding occasion. The disciples were confronted with Christ in a new and an exalted way. But the most important part of that scene was that at the end, when the voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And the voice that came from the cloud was for us as much as it was for Peter, James, and John. This is my son whom I love, listen to him. So first of all, listen to him when what he says is critical in life. What is critical for the living of a Christ-like life? You already know the answer, don't you? Love God and love neighbor. Love God, love others. I say it that here a lot. It's kind of maybe my theme, I don't know. But everything else in life is of secondary importance to those two commands that Jesus has given us. We love our neighbor because we love God. What does this love look like on, on this Valentine's Day? What does love look like when we're trying to love our neighbor? Let me tell you a little story about a young woman named Hope Stout. She was 12 years old, and Hope was diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer. And Hope came to the attention of Make-A-Wish Foundation. I'm sure you know about that organization. It works to provide children with terminal illness a, a wonderful ministry. They, they get to make a wish. They get to have something that they've always wanted. And so they contacted 12-year-old Hope about fulfilling one of her wishes. And in a moment of selflessness that was simply inspiring, Hope Stout wished for one last thing. And that would be that every kid on the make-a-wish list would get their wish granted before she did. To me, this is amazing. She's 12 years old. 12-year-olds have a pretty big wish list, a pretty important thing. But she wished that every other kid ahead of her would get their wish first. Inspired by Hope's example, the organization at Make-A-Wish kicked into overdrive, raising funds and gathering volunteers to, to fulfill the wishes of 155 children that were on the list ahead of Hope. They had almost raised enough money to grant every child's wish when, unfortunately, Hope passed away. But her example transformed that organization. And today they work diligently to see that every child gets his or her, her wish fulfilled as soon as possible. No more waiting on the list for years and years. Why did she do that? A 12-year-old girl. This little girl could have asked for almost anything in the world. Why did she give it all up for the sake of others? In Hope's selfless, extravagant, loving decision, we catch a glimpse of God's ultimate plan for humanity. Love God, love others. Listen to Jesus when he says this is what is critical in life. 
On the last day, this is how you will be judged, not on the basis of how much you've accumulated, not on the basis of how many marathons you've run, how many degrees you've earned. These things will be, as Jesus says, dirty rags. The only question you and I will be asked is how we have loved others and how we love God. Also listen to him when he explains who our neighbor is. It's not just the people in our family. It's not just the people in our neighborhood. It's not just the people that look like us or think like us. Everyone is our neighbor. Our neighbor are those who don't look like you, who don't think like you, who don't necessarily love like you, or speak like you, or pray like you, or vote like you. But love your neighbor, Jesus says. No exceptions. Listen to him. Listen to him as he tells us what is critical in life. Love for God. Love for our neighbor. Listen to him as he defines who our neighbor is. And if you don't know who your neighbor is, you ought to be checking that out. You ought to be looking that up. You ought to be looking who's around you. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. At that moment, Peter heard what he didn't want to hear. Peter had rebuked Jesus earlier when he had spoken of his suffering and death, but now God was saying, hey, listen to him. And there are some truths that necessarily mean change and transformation. Have you ever been confronted with a message that has changed your perspective? One time, a church I was choosing, uh, serving chose as its Lenten theme 40 Days of Love. And each week, members of the congregation were encouraged to show their love and appreciation in different ways. The first week, they were encouraged to send notes to people who had made a positive contribution in their life. And after the service, a man in the congregation came over to talk to me. Now, he was a kind of a Tim the Tool Man Taylor <laughs> kind of macho man. And he said, you know, I, I love you and I love this church, but I'm not going to participate in this 40 days of love thing. It's okay for some folks, but it's a little too syrupy, cheesy, and sentimental for me. So a week went by, and the next Sunday, the tool man, Taylor man, came and found me. And he said, I want to apologize for what I said last Sunday about the 40 days of love. I realized on Wednesday that I was wrong. And I said, Wednesday? <laughs> I must have looked kind of dopey. I said, well, what happened on Wednesday? He said, well, I got one of those letters. The letter came as a total surprise. It was from a person that he had never expected to hear from. And it touched him so deeply, he carries it around in his wallet all the time now. He said, every time I read it, I get tears in my eyes. Mr. Macho Man's heart was touched and transformed. He has a different perspective of love. It was a transforming moment in his life. And suddenly he realized that he was loved by others in his church. It changed his entire outlook. He said, I was so moved by that letter that I sat down and wrote 10 letters myself. So receiving that letter, trans that was a transforming experience for Mr. Macho. It came from a mailbox rather than a mountaintop, but the effect was the same. His perspective was changed. God breaks into our lives, sometimes in surprising ways, and we are changed. We are transformed. Have you gotten the message that you can be changed and transformed? You can love your neighbor no matter who they are or what they look like. Whoever you are or whatever you've done, transformation is possible. Listen to him. Quit living like a caterpillar. Allow him to turn you into a beautiful butterfly. We're not called to remain in the same state that God found us in, but we're to grow and be transformed and change. Love God 
love your neighbor. Be transformed. Let God transform you. It's not necessarily going to happen in a mountaintop experience. It might be gradual day by day. But look for it. Expect it. And let God transform you today and every day, over and over and more and more. Amen. So as our praise team returns, we would remind you that you can still send tithes and offerings to our office. We are grateful that you continue to support the work of this church that continues even in the pandemic. And we thank you very much. Loving God and loving others, may God transform you this week. May God, our Creator, Jesus, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our comfort and guide, be with us now and always. Amen. <laughs>